Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Walk to Wealth podcast. I have a very special guest with me right here, my new friend, Sean. Sean, for anyone that may not know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, what's your little elevator pitch? Yeah, John, I don't get on elevators because I'm really scared of heights. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I, you know, I've been in the financial uh, wealth building industry for a long time, since 1987, uh, right after the first uh, crash that I experienced. Um, and uh, basically started finding this little niche out there called tax lien certificates back in 94. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of went crazy in 1995. I did over a, a million dollars in deals um, and then kind of went crazy from that point. Wrote some books on investing in property, tax liens and deeds. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that are important to know. I teach and have taught more people face to face, eye to eye um, than anybody on the planet. Um, worldwide on investing in tax liens. But the more important part of that is um, I eat my own cooking without throwing up. In other words, I do this. I don't just teach it. Um, there's a lot of gurus out there that I, and I say that in quotation marks, that just mm -hmm. you know, do a couple of things and, and, and want to teach people about it. So one of the things I love about what you're doing, John, is, you know, you're, you're documenting your experience as you're going through, you know, and, you know, I don't want to get into the, I, I walked to a school in barefoot and snow five miles each way. But I mean, when I started my business, the internet didn't exist. Yeah. Wrap your head around that. Um, cell phones didn't yeah, exist. Did. You know what I mean? Uh, we didn't have uh, the ability to research online, from computer and all that. Good stuff. And, you know, has that stuff made it really easy? No. It's just giving you different tools. So the job becomes different. That's all it is. But, you know, that's yeah. who I am. Um, I've spoke uh, around the world, as you indicated, um, and continue to do so, um, do live events. Uh, in the process, I've uh, uh, done a lot of things. I've, I've been around. I just looked at an app um, that I have called TripIt. Um, as I told you, I just got back from Mongolia. I do a lot of uh, international trips to do photography and take my family with me and what have you. And since 19, or excuse me, 2015, since I started using this app, or 2014, I think it is, um, I've been around the world 24 times, just in that time frame. And, um, you know, so I was like, wow, okay, yeah. that's kind of cool. 27 different countries, um, you know, and that's my passion. So that's who I am, um, you know, as far as that's concerned. Why I do this, I've got, a, I've got an 8-year-old and a 24-year-old that uh, is behind the scenes of all my all my editing. My eight-year-old is, is the smart one. Uh, she heard me, uh, you know, it's amazing how smart you guys are nowadays. <laughs> you're, you're a kid still. You're younger than my son. And uh, so I was talking about, you know, we were cooking and I want her to learn how to cook. And there's the, we were cooking with some uh, mushrooms. I was kind of mushrooms. And she says, oh, we've never done. I said, oh yeah, mushrooms are really, really good for you. And there's so many things that are good about it. Matter of fact, there are certain mushrooms that will reconnect neural pathways to help people that have mind problems, you know, PTSD really? and stuff like that. And she's like, really? I said, yeah. So yesterday we were walking to the grocery store. She wanted to walk, didn't want to drive. because She had a vision of a breakfast that she wanted to make. And I said, okay. And so we walked to the grocery store and there was a homeless person because I live in California. So yeah. And, uh, you know, I said, good morning. He said, good morning. And started rambling on about something. I said, oh, yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, and we kept walking. And she says, daddy, his mind is not good. And I go, no, probably not. She goes, maybe we should buy some mushrooms from him at the store. So he <laughs> and I talked to my okay, be careful what you say. Because she's going to go to school and go, hey, hey guys, he takes some mushrooms. You're going to get the wrong idea. <laughs> All the tools that y'all have. And this is what I love. Um, you know, a couple of people ask why have, I haven't retired teaching people. Why would I? Right now, mm -hmm. we have more at our fingertips than we ever have as a human species in the yeah. country that allows you to do absolutely freaking anything. I'd yeah. be remiss if I didn't share the information that I have come across, like you're doing right now, John. And I, again, applaud you on that um, for the last 27 years. Why would I not? You know, yeah. I, I, you know and this is not a braggadocious thing, but I mean, come on, John, I've forgotten more than you've even learned in the last couple of years. And the fact that you're documented is, is commendable because you're going through that whole process and, and you're helping people in that journey um, with that whole process. So again, 
you know, it's funny because I have a lot of friends that I hang out with that we, you know, been teaching for a long time. And just not only four months ago, we were at a conference in Las Vegas, a bunch mm -hmm. of young people in the group under 30, and we all were having dinner afterwards. And uh, Annette, one of my colleagues says, you know, what? we have a responsibility. These people were just soaking up all that information. And these millennials aren't as bad as we thought. I go, no, no, this is really cool because there's a segment of them that really want to learn like there is everyone. And so the, I just love it. I'm having fun with it. Obviously, I have a passion about it. So there you yeah, go. Well, and we're going back out. We're doing live events. Yeah, part of well, part of my mission in life is to it's it, it sounds really nice, but I got it from Plato's allegory of the cave, and uh, the duty of the enlightened is to enlighten the unenlightened. So pretty much, yep. as, in in my words, as soon as you learn something, put as many people as you can on. And so it's yeah. like, and uh, another full transparency. One of the reasons I started a podcast was very selfish, is because like if you ever hear me tell a story, I'll tell a story and I'll branch off into like five other stories that have nothing to do with the main story. But so by the time I get back on the main story, I lost my train of thought, and then yeah. I just don't know where I'm at. So it's like part of the podcast because I know in the future I want to write a book. So it's like once it's that time, whether it's next year or ten years down the line, I could just go back and re-listen to my stuff, and it's like that's book material right there. And I just write right. that and all the stuff that I learned for the most part. Uh, so as you said, you know, um, documenting it all down, it's super, you know. Super, super useful. Super and then, plus, John, you become a better teacher when you start teaching people things because you have to really understand mm -hmm. what it is that you're saying. So one of the reasons I got so good at tax liens and tax deed purchasing is because I started having to teach people. So yeah. for those of you who don't know what tax liens or tax deeds are, you know, real briefly, when somebody fails to pay property taxes on their property, the county is obligated to offer those up to the public. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not dealing with the property owner. I'm just giving the money to the county that they would have charged anyways. And so what happens is, is that there's an interest rate of anywhere from, you know, 10% on the low side up to 50% on the high side. Now, I'm not causing anything to happen. The property owner already owes the money to the county. The county needs the money. Number one, schools, roads, for, you know, all that stuff. So they're yeah. kind of going, okay, what do we do here? Um, they're not in a position to make money at the situation, but they, that would be a conflict of interest. So the, the high interest rate is motivation for the problem. And the nice thing about it is if you fail to do that, they offer that to the public so that I can go in there. I put up the money. The money is still owed to the county. Okay. So when they come in to pay off those taxes, they give it to the county. The county sees that I'm the lien holder of record. I get the money back within five to 10 business days. Everybody's happy as a pig in mud, right? Well, if they don't pay, um, you know, after three or four years, I get the property. And I get the property free and clear of all liens and encumbrances, including mortgages. So that is in a nutshell of what it is that I do. I stumbled upon this because somebody told me, have you heard of these? Back in 1994, I think it was. I bought my first one in 95. Mm -hmm. And then 90 days after buying my first one, I had some attorneys ask if I could show them how to do it. And because uh, they had heard that I was the expert, and I thought I was <laughs> a little older than you are now, John, but I thought I was. <laughs> and then again, teaching people, I had to learn a lot because they had a lot of questions for me and they were attorneys. And, you know, I had a little bit of a, uh, a uh, oh, self-conscious thing. I, I never finished uh, college. I, I went to one week of college. It was in a really bad motorcycle accident. My parents didn't have the money. To put me back in there, but um, you know, always that was a little bit of stigma for me. Like, mm. you know, am I really, you know, type of a deal? Am I the person that needs it? And here I got these attorneys with law degrees, and uh, one of them, um, a statement that he said really changed uh, me. He goes, You know, Sean, I, I became an attorney without going to school. Mm. I, I didn't know that was possible. He goes, Yeah, he goes, Wear it like a badge of honor, don't hide behind. Yeah. And ever since then, I'm right. You know what? He's right. And uh, so that changed me. That aspect It's like, you know, I've read more books than most people I know. Yeah. Um, I continue to do so. I continue to absorb. And that, John, that's why I love this podcast is because I know that's who you are. And so you're starting off that journey early. When I was traveling in the very beginning, I made a pact that I would not watch any movies. Um, the only thing I would do is two things on a plane. 
I would either uh, read books or I would write. Yeah. That's me, you know, again, I'm not trying to date myself, but we didn't have audibles and all that other good stuff. Audibles don't work on planes, by the way. They yeah. just sleep. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know I, I tried it. You know, <laughs> yeah. But in cars and stuff like that. There you go. But anyways, um, you know, so that's, that's how this, uh, that whole journey started. Um, and, uh, Robert, do you, do you, do you, do you, I mean, while we're still on the subject, before we go uh, move on, I like the fact that you said that wear it as a badge of honor. I feel like uh, one of the things, so I also didn't finish college. I was in the middle of my sophomore year. My first year, I loved it. I had a 378, you know, grades were great. I was excelling in a couple clubs. I did a fashion show because why not? It was I was at UConn stores on the main campus, uh, and I, it was a, an amazing opportunity, right? But I knew coming into college, right, I was only going to school for two reasons to network and to learn how to live my own, right? Second year, my sophomore year, pandemic happened. Everything's online now. Everything's wiped out. And that that first, I guess, pandemic semester, this, these professors, I mean, they had the summer, but most of them still didn't know how to use Zoom class. No one was engaging. Everyone had their cameras off. So the two reasons I went into school instantly got wiped out. And then I, I read my first book, which was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and from there, it wasn't, the, you know, the best book that everyone made it out to be, but it shifts your mindset enough to know that there's another way of thinking out there. And so I I read that book. And then the second book I read after that was a book called I Will Teach You to Be Rich uh, by Ramit Sethi. And that book is probably the best personal finance book in terms of like practicality. That's how I learned, got into investing in index funds. That's how I learned about credit cards. And, you know, that's how I learned about budgeting. And not just budgeting like well, and then, budget. and then uh, there's on top of that, I'll, I'll recommend a couple if you haven't. Is the richest man in Babylon? Yeah, that's another one I read right after. It's a, it's a must read. And then you know, I'm a big fan. Let me say this correctly of Dave Ramsey. Okay. In so much as I like the fact that he gets into this whole, you know, pay yourself for all that. Stuff. Yeah. Sometimes he gets a little aggressive, I think. Um, but I understand why he has to, to kind of shake people out of their mentality. But, you know, I, I work with these young kids sometimes. They're like, yeah, but will that build my credit? I go, stop with the building. your credit. Yeah. Stop it. Okay. You know, stop. Pay things off massively. I was just teaching yeah. yesterday. He's getting his first car and, and he goes, I want to do Uber just to pay, make the payments. I go do Uber to make two of the payments a month. Yeah. And I says, you'll have that thing paid off almost in, in like 14 months. And I go, and then from that point forward, if you have a car payment, shame on you. Yeah. Because you can trade that car up in the meantime, continue to save that money. And then always, always, always this attitude that you have to have car payments, you have to have mortgages, all this stuff. If I'm not big on paying off houses. I'm big on paying off houses so you can leverage the equity within the house. Yeah. I think that's so it's an ego thing. It's a yeah, it's an ego What's thing, that? too. A lot of people my age, it's like, you'll see Facebook posts. I literally seen them the other day. And it was like, I got 100 bucks for anyone that could say they live on their own, got their own car, and, you know, it's not at their, it's still at their parents' house. And it's like, it, I, I feel like people take pride in knowing, like, too much pride in being on their own. Where and just taking on expenses. That's the way I see it. The, you know, the more stuff you're paying for is just the more expenses. So it's like I could stay at my grandparents, which I do now, for as long as I can. Mm -hmm. You know, that's you know by all means, I'm I'm saving out on a whole entire mortgage payment. Like I'm, that's a smart mm -hmm. business decision. I have I'm lowering my expenses, and so a lot of people my age, it's like they, they, that ego thing. That's oh, you know, I pay for my own phone. I pay for all my own this. It's like congrats, you just pay you more should. expenses. <laughs> you're just paying more expenses, more money out of your pocket. You know, as a businessman, that's a terrible or a business owner to say like more coming out of your pocket is never a good thing. And so, um, right. but kind of back to the college thing. Um, uh, and so I was saying that I ended up making the decision to leave school because I realized that I could teach myself more on my own than school could teach me at that point in time, especially because I was just taking gen eds. And so, yeah, And not only that, I can also start pursuing my dream because I knew I never wanted to work for someone else. And I, I had early on the idea that I wanted to retire early. But after learning and, you know, attending so much from like summits and stuff like that, I realized I actually never want to retire similar to what you're doing. I just want to love what I do so much that I just never want to stop doing it. And although it's work, it'll never feel like it because it's my passion and not, I'm not slaving myself 
in a job for a paycheck where I don't really enjoy. And part of 100%. which is this podcast, it's a passion project. If I never made a dollar for this po- podcast, 40, 50 years down the line, I'll still probably be doing it. Like it was, mm-hmm. it was never made for money because I just enjoy learning about things that interest me and things that matter. And then giving that back right. to as many right. people as I can. Absolutely. And so, um, well, here, I'll, I'm going to piggyback on your whole living at your grandparents house. You should be paying as if you were paying rent or a mortgage. And then that way, I mean, because first of all, it elevates your, your water level, uh, all uh, water finds its own level. Mm-hmm. So if you're pretending like you're making those expenses, first of all, so I, I'm going to go way back in time. My brother one time said, oh, I'm, I'm going to save by moving down the street. I'm saving $600 a month in rent. I said, really? You're saving $600 a month. Okay. Where is it? He goes, what do you mean? I go, where's the money you're saving? No, no, I'm paying less. I go, so you're not saving anymore. Mm. He goes, no, no, I'm paying less in rent. I go, but you said you were saving $600 a month. I said, you're just not spending. So what you've just done is lowered your standard of living. Mm. So think about that for a minute. I want your audience to think about that. Water finds its own level. That doesn't mean to jack up your expenses on that. But if you're in a situation where you can take advantage of, hey, my grandparents got a place. I can rock it here for a while. You say, okay, how much would this have cost me without that? Then you make that obligation to pay yourself because that money comes back. First of all, it elevates your thinking because it's just the way the universe works. Yeah. Okay. If your expenses are $10,000 a month, I'm just going to exaggerate, you know, whatever the case is. And that's where you need to be. But five of that is savings money. Then that's where you need to be. You know what I mean? That's how much the, you know, okay, the universe doesn't, doesn't understand anything, but, but John needs $10,000 a month. So opportunities come that way. The challenge is if you say, oh, I don't have all these expenses, so therefore I don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> you do, but they're not going to somebody else. Go back to your rich dad, poor dad comment on that. You know, that's what that's all about. So, you know, the one thing about uh, uh, this kid that I was talking to He's like, I love the fact he's like, I'm going to go do Uber. I'll do it whatever, three or four times a, a, a month to make the payment on this. And I go, yeah, but do three or four times is going to make you a lot more than the payment. So take all of those and pay that down as if. Yeah. And then you'll never have a car payment again. So there's okay. As long I get an expense, there better be something that's paying that. You know, there better be something that's generating the money to pay that. Yeah. And that's where to I bounce off of that a little bit is uh another thing in the similar like area it's like uh having your assets pay for your luxuries is another thing that mm-hmm. kind of similar concept is like not buying anything or paying for anything until you have enough assets producing passive income to then finance whatever whether that's the car right. or your personal residence or you know jewelry like for me my goal is until i get five investment properties i'm not planning on moving out my grandparents because I imagine I'm cash flowing two to 250 per door. And then from there, and I already spoke to a couple, you know, I spoke to a couple hard money lenders just because like the way my grandparents situation works, it's like they have assisted living. So if I move out, then their whole situation kind of gets, 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 uh, you know, weird. Oh. Yeah. It gets complicated and they're already pretty old. Uh, they're both over 70. My grandpa's about to be 80 soon. So it's like, that's wouldn't be ideal for me. House hacking. So although I would love to, it wouldn't, it's not ideal for me. Um, and so then I'm going to just buy duplexes a little further out. Cause if you know, I don't know if how Stanford was back in 95, but prices are a little high now in Stanford. <laughs> so I don't plan, yeah, I don't plan on investing anywhere near Stanford. So like middle of Connecticut homes where I can get a duplex for like 160, 150. And so I plan. But here, let me give you a little hack, John. Let me give you a little hack. So you got grandparents that are, Oh, yeah. They're probably going to need some assisted living kind of situation. Yeah. So there's a program in Connecticut where you can get a five bedroom, whatever, yeah. single level, uh, turn it into adult assisted living. Yeah, I heard that, about that uh, recently. Yep. And the state will pay you up to $5,000 per room. Uh, real back of the napkin na- math, it's going to take about 60% of the revenue to run. Yeah. It. And 40% is pure profit. Yeah. So there's two things that happen in that situation. Your grandparents are in a facility um, that you approve of, and it's not, you know, 
like, oh my God, I can't believe they're here. Yeah. And number one, number two is you're building equity in the piece of property that you have. You get tremendous cash flow from that. You can do the math. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, everybody's taken care of. So there's kind of a double dipper. Yeah, and it's funny that you bring that up because I, I was looking into you a little bit. I was on your YouTube page trying to get a feel for you and watching some of your YouTube videos. And Isabel is... Isabel. Yeah, so Great she actually showed up to some part of the, the CTRIA, the Real Estate Investor Association mm -hmm. here in Connecticut. She actually was the guest for not this past month, but the month before where she talked about residential assisted mm -hmm. living and she gave us the whole spiel. She was there talking for about 2000, not 2000 for two hours, uh, you know, giving us the whole mm -hmm. rundown as to residential assisted living and everything. And it's ironic that you also just so happened to recently get into a conversation with her as well. So, uh, yeah, the residential assisted living, the projected profits from that is ridiculous. It's like crazy yeah. how much money you can make from that. No matter how many vitamins I take, yeah. I'm going to get old. Yeah. Right. The baby boomers are hitting that. They're right at the crest of it. And uh, so there's a huge opportunity, you know, as, as Isabel says, yeah. so that's something that you can look at. You know, And that's how she got into yeah. it. Was her grandparents. And like, while we're on the topic, some while we're on the topic of real estate investing, can we go dive a little bit more into the tax lien stuff? Because that's actually one of the areas that I know pretty little about in terms of investing through tax liens. So I know you kind of gave us a little rundown, uh, like the breakdown a little earlier, but uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the tax lien stuff and how, how it works? Yeah. So basically the way it works is, is, is this, you know, there's 5,000 taxing jurisdictions in the United States. Every single one of them has some form or another. There's either two things that can happen. Either a state sells the property for the back taxes mm -hmm. and you own it free and clear. There is no redemption period. Or they sell a lien on the property that has a redemption period of anywhere from, uh, you know, one year on the low side to about three years on the high side. But during that redemption period, you're going to be paid a substantial interest rate, mm -hmm. which will probably be 16, 18, 25 percent. So either way, it's a win-win situation. Now, because you're taking the county's position, John, you're actually the county. So you have superiority over all liens and encumbrances, including a mortgage, including the IRS. So if I get a property and I put $1,000 in back taxes, I pay off. Let's just exaggerate this, okay? Let's say it's a $100,000 piece of property just to keep it even. And I put those up there and the person doesn't come to the county to redeem that, then my next obligation is to go ahead and start the foreclosure process. Now, one of the things you're not doing is you're not kicking anybody out of yeah. this. Okay, that's just completely baloney. Okay, nobody loses a property to a couple of years back taxes that's living in the house. And it's not one of these things that are going, oh my God, I forgot to pay the mortgage and the taxes. Honey, we gotta move. It doesn't happen that way. Okay, this is, you know, in, in the thousands of deals that I've done and, and, and help people with, um, I had one scenario that where the owner lived in the property and I was able to call them up and say, okay, what's going on? How can we help you out? That type of a deal. The county can't do that. So back to my scenario is I go through the foreclosure process. Once I foreclose the property, I own that property in any liens or encumbrances on that property that existed before or no more. Okay, so an example would be I bought a property recently in, uh, um, where was this, was Savannah, and I paid, I think, $7,000 for it, um, worth, you know, give or take about $100,000 um, AR, um, our uh, uh, wholesale, mm -hmm. ARV, worth $230,000, you know, so I'm putting some money into the property. Um, you know, it's uh, in under rehab right now. I'll put about sixty, seventy thousand dollars into the property. We're going to sell it for approximately two hundred thirty thousand mm. dollars. You know, so one of the things that I teach my students is, you know, I'm not going to teach you how to buy a Learjet. Yeah, I'm not going to teach you how to be all. You know, look, I love Grant Cardone <laughs> and all those guys, but I just think that's just a little unrealistic for ninety eight percent of the population. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I say this, what if, what if I could show you, what if you did get 18%? What if you could get properties free and clear? What if you did just get one property like the one I just described a year? Is that going to change your lifestyle? I would say yes for 90% of the people listening to this right now. And so that's what I talk about is like reality. I, I serve up a dose of reality. 
is there some work involved? Like, in, yeah. um, you know, unless you're trying to play the lottery for the super billion tonight, I think it's at a hundred uh, yeah, billion. Yeah, it's over a billion. Yeah, it's, over, it's like 1.7, I think, or something like that billion. It's ridiculous. That is nuts. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just not realistic. And so, you know, and that's a lot of your people listening to this can wrap their heads around that. They can say, you know what, I can do that. So when I start, when people start talking about, we're going to show you how to become a millionaire. You know what I can do? I can show you how to become a hundred thousand area. Now, if you want to become a millionaire, then just duplicate what I'm doing by four. That's yeah. it. That's it. You know, and so that, to me, that's very realistic on any of that. And if anybody wants, you know, I have conferences going around the country all the time, John. If anybody wants to get uh, information on locations or whatever, it's really, really simple. Just go to um, uh, my uh, my general site, which is S-A-E-N, Sean360.com. Yeah. And wherever I happen to be at that moment, there'll be a little invitation that can pop up and, and you can figure that. I think we're in Dallas. Next yeah. Year, so. And I don't know when this podcast is going out, but whatever it says <laughs> up there, that's where you Yeah, can. and it'll be in the show notes as well, too. So anyone can find it there. Good. And then um, another question. Yeah. So um, the first, like, uh, I guess, limiting belief that comes to mind is, so most of my listeners are in Connecticut. And a lot of them mm -hmm. are people that I know locally but from my hometown of Stanford. And so prices down here in lower Fairfield County are ridiculously high. So you'll never find a home for a hundred thousand here. Average single family. Home. Yeah. But that's it. Again, again, that that's it. I yeah. love what you said. Limiting belief. I, I have, I live in California. I've never bought a tax lien or deed in California. Okay. Okay. One of the things that we teach you how to do is from the comfort of your own. And again, this is way back before internet or anything else like that. We figured this one out. All the internet did for us is accelerate what we were on. Yeah. And so, you know, this whole, wow, you can do it from home. Uh, yeah, I've been doing that since the postman. Yeah. So, you know, like for instance, I mentioned Savannah. I've never seen that property person to person. Never. I've never seen boots on the ground. Yet. Now, I'm not saying that's the way everybody does it at the beginning. I've just got enough experience. That that's not a concern of mine. Um, but don't limit yourself. You know, here, here's the way I want to put it. If you go want to go duck hunting, you go to where the yeah. ducks are. Okay. And again, Connecticut is not a good tax lien or deed state. It just isn't, um, you know, and that's okay. You know, it might be sometime just like for instance, uh, Georgia, where I'm doing some deals right now, that wasn't always good. Texas used to be, yeah. Florida. um, Florida is a great place to go right now. Pennsylvania is a really good place. You know, see Ohio, um, Indiana. So again, you don't have to be there to do it, but so what? If you had to get on a plane to make $100,000, what row, what seat do I get yeah. peanuts? <laughs> and so my, my my next limiting belief that probably comes to mind, or at least most people would probably come to mind, is then um, how would you then do it successfully without having boots on the ground and not having someone to see the property? Well, there's uh, okay, again... This is, there's so many advents of making that happen. I mean, you know, uh, let's go back in time. I didn't have it. Yeah. We didn't have these things called cell phones. So when I'm looking at a piece of property, I'm ready to make a decision on it. First of all, I just get online. I can find out what the comps are in the area. I don't need a realtor to do that. If I do want to see what the property in current condition is, because I never trust the pictures online, you know, I call up John, the realtor, and I said, hey, listen, don't go out of your way, but while you're driving around, can you give me... A photo. a photo of the property in current condition of what you're thinking on it. If I get this property, I'd love to have you as my realtor. In the meantime, I just need some visuals. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. So being resourceful and calling people in the area, essentially. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so without giving too much away, you know, how would someone get into this? And Oh, no, you got to give it all away. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, you've got to, you've got to determine what your objective is, you know, so what's your goal? And, and I get, again, I always tell people when I'm doing my three day um, workshops, I tell people in the very beginning, you've got to determine what it is that you're trying to accomplish in the very beginning financially. And the more time you spend getting some context around that, the more successful yeah. you're going to be. And what I mean by that is everybody wants to help you become successful, believe it or not. But if you don't know what success looks like, how could yeah, definitely. Okay, so if I go in there and say I want to make two hundred thousand dollars, okay, then what I do is let's start with that, 
And everybody starts with, I just need to get a deal. That's complete bullshit. That's <laughs> baloney. Okay. What you want to do is you want to say, what is my objective? And then how many properties do I need to look at in order to get a deal? Okay, so, and if that deal, and you're, the, a lot of this is just assumptions, and that's completely okay, but you gotta, you gotta paint a target on the wall. You can't just shoot a hole in the wall and then paint a circle around it. And say, yeah. it. So what you wanna do is $200,000, say, oh, guess what? I'm gonna make $40,000 per deal. Let's just use that as a random number. Okay, in order to make $40,000 and $250,000, I have to do, right, six deals. In order to do a deal, I have to look at X number of properties. So you're working it backwards. So then you start saying to yourself, okay, where can I go to find enough deals to support that? Yeah. Follow what I'm saying, John? So now all it does is becomes that you don't get frustrated when you go to an auction and nothing happens. You go, oh, that's okay. Because also I, I figured out that I'm probably gonna have to go to three auctions before I get one deal. Mm -hmm. And then I might not get anything for four deal, four options. Then I'm going to get three on one. Okay, you know what I mean. So there's there's a momentum that happens, and I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge anybody listening. That happens with anything yeah. you're doing. Figure out what you're trying to do. One of the things that I tell people: if you're at my conference trying to dip your foot in the pool to see if this works, leave. I've already proven this works. Okay, what you need to do is figure out what you want and mold this. Yeah. Industry. Because we've proven over and over and over again. So that would be like going this. This is a really good example, actually. That would be like buying a Subway's uh, franchise. And then the franchise people from Subway's, whatever, I don't know who they are. But they come by and say, hey, we need to see your place of business where you're doing. Oh, I'm going to make them out of my garage for a while until I make sure that <laughs> this is going to work. That's not what? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. There's already a formula of success. That's why you're doing this. I'm going to tell you, doing tax lien certificates without some type of guidance, whether you're watching my YouTube or whatever the case is, it's really difficult because, you know, one of the things that happened, you brought up the pandemic that didn't surprise me about the pandemic is how every county treated it differently. So everybody says, oh, Sean, you live in California. Oh, my gosh, you must be locked down. I go, no, I wasn't. I was in Placer County. Placer County basically gave the governor the <laughs> They're like, we don't care. We're not closing down restaurants. We're not closing down this stuff. You guys do whatever you want. Now, I went, you know, 30 minutes away to another county and they had a different attitude about it. So when I'm looking at tax, which didn't surprise me because of my experience yeah. tax lanes, every county interprets the rules differently. And this is what makes it so cool because what I do is I find the little nuance in that little county and I go, ooh, okay, now here's where the money is. And boom, I just start hitting that. You make relationships with the people of the county. They know that you're somebody that gets these things done. And the rest is Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. sense. And I like the, the fact that you said working backwards to find your goal. I feel like a lot of people have the idea of goal setting all backwards. And for example, like to really? use this analogy with a GPS, you don't, you know, look what's the next turn. You put in the final destination. And then it calculates for you. If you don't put in the final destination first and you're just going street by street, you never end up getting to where you want to get to. <laughs> yeah. It's I a, love that. <laughs> I'm going, yeah. what are you doing? I just want you to get a deal. I just need to get a deal. I know you don't need to get a deal. You don't need, because you know what? What if the first deal only made you, let's say $10,000 and everything that could go wrong possibly yeah. went wrong? What's the chances of you doing deal number two? It's not. Okay, but if you found out, well, I got to do 10 deals. Let's just use that as a number or five. Let's use five. Yeah. I have five deals. Well, the first one, okay. Well, I got the yeah. back one out of the way. <laughs> and I only got to do four more. In, in, as opposed to putting the final destination in and going, if you didn't do that, you go, okay, well, well, we got to get in the car, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. You got to get in the car. And then what do we do? Uh, I think yeah. we start the engine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Good, good. Let's start the engine. It, it, and see, that sounds so ridiculous, but yet, like you just pointed out, that's how. Yeah, and another thing too, having that final destination already set and in place, or at least having a you know a general idea as to where you want to end up. I mean, the more specific, the better, obviously. But at least if you know, that'll pull you through all the little bad deals or all the little bad days, or you know, no matter you know whatever career or path you end up going down. But not having that aim, 
and you stumble into, you know, an obstacle, you're pretty much screwed because it's like, why keep going? But if you know where you're going to end up, yeah, so exactly. Aimless. They're aimless. And so they're just wandering, right? And so when you have that aim, you have that final destination, it's like, ah, you know, this sucks, but I know where I want to end up and it's going to be all worth it. Without having that aim at the end. Here's the other thing about that. This is really important. If you get off, let's say that uh, we're driving down the road, John, we want to get yeah. something to eat. And we pull over to get something to eat. What does the GPS do? It gets wrong. Oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. It calculates. And then, and then it goes, okay, 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 okay. We just stop to get something to eat. And it recalculates. Yeah. So if you and I decide to stop by, you know, Sally May's house and, you know, whatever along the way, um, that doesn't mean we're not going to go to our final destination. It just means we're a little bit of a diversion. It calculates. So that's part of the whole process. So if we did yeah. do our first deal, and it sucked every way to Sunday. It's no big deal. We just calculated, hey, Sean told us this was going to happen. And the way I would look at that is at least we got the bad one out of the way yeah. at the very beginning. So the rest are Exactly. Easy. And the bad deals usually give you the most experience, which just makes every deal afterwards easier, even if they're not easy deals, because you already got the experience from the bad deal early on. You know, the rest come become easier. Yep. And to stick with this, the, the driving analogy, yep. it's life throws curveball. I mean, as you said, every time, you know, let's say you know, there's there's traffic in the road or let's say one street is closed, GPS just recalcul- recalibrates automatically. It just recalibrates without, you know, panicking, without, you know, malfunctioning or shutting down just easily. And so if we think kind of like a GPS, it'll help us get, you know, get through a lot of those tough times. Cause just all we have to do is redirect, recalibrate, and we're still going to end up. Yeah. This, the second thing I want to add to that too, John, is who yeah. you hang out. That is the most important thing. Okay, I'm going to tell you this because you know, hopefully, your listeners are young and and trying to learn some things. You know, that doesn't mean you go home and talk to your friends and say, "I'm not allowed to hang out with you anymore. You're not successful." The point of that is, if they're if they are where you want to be financially, then listen to them. If they're not, get some other people around you that are where you want to be and start listening. Okay, active listening. And this is the thing that drives me nuts with any student. It doesn't matter what age. Okay. Um, I love people that just do what I tell yeah. them to do. I am not going to teach you how to do brain surgery because I don't know how to do that. Okay. But like you said with the GPS, um, you know, I you're way too young for this. But back in the day when they first came out with Tom Toms and all the different GPSs before they were on the phone, you used to be able to download South Park as your GPS <laughs> voice. <laughs> and I freaking love it. And Cartman would come on there, hey, dumbass, you're supposed to turn right. You know? And it was just because that's kind of how I felt when I was working with people. It's like, dude, I told you to go do this. Why yeah. did you do that? Well, I thought, I don't care what you thought. And it just, and then they get frustrated because they're like, he just doesn't care. And I go, no, I don't. You know, I don't care. So surround yourself with people that are already where you want to be. Yeah. And listen, listen, write down, find out, watch the steps, do what they're doing. Um, there, there's so much wisdom out there that's available to you. And, uh, you know, and I just tell you, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to figure this out. Um, we're going back out speaking again and doing these events and we've had them for um, uh, you know, getting ready for these. Uh, this is our second month, and there's some new people. We got kids, kids under 25 that are working with us, and uh, you know, I'm just watching them. I'm going, dude, 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 dude. You see Jerry over there? He's 52. He's done 148 events with me in one year. Please listen to what he tells yeah. you. We need. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at their box of all the electronics. I'm going, we don't need that stuff. Okay, let me tell you what we need to get across the finish line. And that's a smaller version of what I'm talking about. So seek out the people in the area. You want to become, because that's my franchise. That's yeah. my franchises, you know. You want to become successful at the bug business and killing bugs at people's houses? You know, find a franchise. They're going to tell you what works and what doesn't work. I mean, one of the reasons that Chick-fil-A is so successful is because they have a recipe yeah. for success. And if you don't follow it, you no longer work there. So th- those are some, you know, I, I mean, very pointed, 
you know, do these things and, and, and yeah, don't that, be that brings up, you know, that makes right? me think of three things. The first one that comes to mind is a smart man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from them, the mistakes of others, right? Back to what you were saying about reinventing the wheel and finding people. It's like, you know, you don't have to make the mistakes yourself. Whatever. If someone already, you know, has the blueprint, if, if Chick-fil-A already has, you know, the step-by-step, -step, why are you going to make another step-by-step? -step? It's like, it's there for you, you know, just use it. Right. And uh, that's one thing that I kind of had to um, really internalize because uh, creativity is a massive blessing. It's also a massive curse. Yeah. It's because, yeah, there's, there's a book out there. I'll recommend to your listeners. Um, it's called uh, by mm. holiday and it's called so is the mm. and I highly recommend listening to that book um, because Tim Ferriss does an interview with him at the very end. And I find that very powerful, but that's probably one of the better books I've read in the last couple of years, but that is a great segue into what yeah. you just talked about. You, you know, ego is more than just, I'm the best. That's not, that's not what this book is about. If you understand what ego is early on, it's going to serve you very mm -hmm. well as you move forward, you know, but a little bit of that is ego when you go in there and go, well, I can do this. And I know, <laughs> yeah, really? And I had somebody recently, a young, younger entrepreneur that said, um, you know, let me help with this and that. And I go, no offense, but yeah. you've never done this before. Well, that, that, and they got all offended by it. I'm sorry, but I've got somebody here that made $250,000 doing this in six months. Yeah. Let's listen to that person. Let's not you listen. I'm going to listen yeah. to that person also. And it took them a while to go, oh, I see what you're doing. I, yeah, I, I didn't ask, I didn't say your help wasn't valued. I'm just saying your help is going to be valued in the proportion yeah. that you can give them. And that's another thing too. I, I firmly believe that the blind can't lead the blind. And if you haven't been to where I want to be or aren't going to, or, you know, haven't already been there at some point in time, it's like your, your, your advice is more like, you know, just your opinion not really advice to me and it's like i respect you yeah, know yeah. you because a lot of times these people are coming from you know a place of genuine care but it's like un, un, unfortunately absolutely it's like you know all this is going in one ear not the other i'm just smiling to be polite essentially and there's like yeah. a lot of people i think yeah. when my, at my age being 20 a lot of people who are older than me um and i got into several conversations with other you know other people and they're like, John, you know, you should be, you you should really go back to school. You know, you should be in school. And it's like, you know, at 20 years old, you know, how many billionaires have you met? I, I've been fortunate enough. I met Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams, the brokerage that I work at. I've sat three feet away from him for an entire day. At 20 years old, I, I was in the presence of a billionaire. It's like most people that are telling me to go back to school. It's like you, if there's, there's another thing I posted on my Instagram story. It's like, if you aren't chasing your dreams, don't dare tell me how to chase mine. And I, it resonated with me so much yeah, because it's go. like right. so many people are living someone else's dream or have either suppressed their dreams for whatever the case may be. And it's like, then there's people out there like me who are, and because I'm young, right. you're going to try to, you know, try and suppress mine as well. It's like, I, I will not allow you to do that. I, I, I stand firmly behind me chasing you know, me going down this road and doing what I'm doing, because at the very least, I'm willing to bet on myself. And so it's like, at the very least, 100%. that's enough to keep me going. Right. It just, just be a... exactly. You're not, no one else and will. So, um, back to what I mentioned earlier about me losing my train of thought. This is one of those <laughs> times where I lost my train of thought where I was going with this. I just, <laughs> no, no, no. I, the thought just came to mind, but back to your saying the blind can't lead the blind and everything. Then that I kind of got off to that tangent. I had several situations where people try to tell me um, that I should go back to school. And it's like, why? Oh, because you went to school. Okay. What did you do with your degree? Nothing. And it's like, you know, John, you need to go back to school. Yes. If you want to become a doctor. You need to go back to school if you want to become an attorney. You need to go back to school if you want to become an engineer. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to that, but any more of this BS where people are pounding the drum that you have to have a mm. college degree. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, 
you know, it depends mm-hmm. on where you want to go. There's a lot of things that that is valuable for, but there's a lot of things that it was like, okay, so you yeah. can prove that you want to do it. I think another thing too, it's like how much, what, you know, you have to ask yourself what does security look like to you? And like, for me, security, security doesn't look like a degree. Hey, hey, hang on one second, John. Come here, baby. What? Oh, here you go, text? Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Good. I will. Thank you, baby. She's going to, she sent a friend of hers a message. <laughs> come over to swim. And so she's making sure that I saw the message. <laughs> she sends a video. She goes, Dad, I want to do a video. <laughs> Play it. Play it. Yes, Important exactly. You got to keep that child in you alive. <laughs> But yeah, um, where was I? Oh yeah, so back to security. Security to me doesn't look like a degree. Security to me looks like having enough passive income to make sure my bills are paid. You know, so it's like we have two very different, you know, definition of security. And so people are like, oh, you know, what if real estate doesn't work out? Well, one, you know, <laughs> well, the first thing that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's been really yeah. bad for a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, that, it doesn't, and that doesn't even make if any let's sense. say. Let's say, let's go, you know, dive a little bit more into that. I'm the type of person I'm willing to burn all ships. You know, it's like if I have to burn all my ships of retreat in order to, you know, fight harder or, you know, get what I have to get done. It's like, I'll do that if I have to. Like, I, retreat wasn't an option. Well, here, let me, let me put it another way, too. Let me put it another way. What if I were to, this is what I tell people your age all the time with tax lanes, with my industry. What if I told you you weren't allowed to make any money? For one full year. And you just had to get really, really mm-hmm. good at the skill set of finding deals. That's all you were allowed to do. You're going to have to bus tables. You're going to have to do Uber. You have to do whatever. But for one straight year, let's train you on how mm-hmm. to find deals. And you got really freaking good at that. But you weren't allowed to make any money. But after one year, you make 250 a year for the rest of your life. Not, okay, if that. you're asking me, yeah. That's what I try to tell you. So what if I said, okay, maybe you're not exactly the most motivated person in the world. Maybe you do have other obligations. Maybe you do have some things out there that, that maybe prevent you from, maybe it takes you two years. Please tell me what career you're going to get that's going to give you that kind of an opportunity. doesn't exist. doesn't exist. So if I told it, even I can stretch it out and say two years, you're not allowed to make any money for two years, but after two years, you make $40 mm-hmm. million dollars for the rest of your life. Please tell me the other industry that says that. So when you go to school for four years and pay them a crap load of money, where's mm-hmm. the guarantee? There are some colleges right now that are being challenged on some of their law degree stuff because they're not disclosing what their students that graduate with a law degree are making and they're resisting. There's some, um, uh, there's some, uh, new laws before Congress trying to say, Hey, you guys got to disclose how many of your Berkeley grads that get their law degree. What's their average income. And a lot of people would be shocked at how low it is, Really, you know? And so it's just, I, I, again, again, this back to that perspective, you know, when somebody sits there and says, what if real estate doesn't work? Okay, it doesn't work out. What is what is that barometer of not working look like for you? So if that person's making eighty thousand dollars a year, is that what that looks yeah. like? I don't make eighty thousand. You know, so again, uh, uh, I got to go right back to what you said earlier, which was which is smart. Is you know, if you're not where I want to be at, then I'm just going to kind kindly smile and say thank you. Mm. I'm not gonna be rude. It's just you know. Why would I take exactly not doing and do? kind of to stay on this topic too it's like with real estate most people leave the industry because they have these false expectations coming in and most people don't understand the concept of sacrifice and Gary V talks about it a lot and just commit yourself 10 years or five years at least into one area and even if you make you know no money That's essentially true. for the first five or ten years you know you afterwards because you're pretty much master all the skills is necessary it's like afterwards it's like 
you're going to be making boatloads of money afterwards. You know, it's like for me this year for real estate, I've only closed three rentals so far. And I had this, you know, the thought coming in, you know, I'm going to be top producer. I'm going to be selling, you know, hundred thousand dollars in GCI first year easily. And, and this hasn't gone that way at all. But it's like, I had to, you know, sit back and realize that I'm not in here to be a one hit wonder. I'm here to make a career. So even if this year I don't make as much money as I initially planned, I'm still going to do everything I can, like necessary to learn and grow so that once the snowball starts rolling, you know how avalanche starts. And so it's like the avalanche follows shortly after. So it's like to keep on doing what I have to do. I work a second job right now, but it's like, as soon as I close my fourth transaction, like as soon as like buy or sell transaction, then I'm the first two deals paying off right. all my debts. That's my car and my student loans. Next two deals is to build up my reserves, build up to a year reserves, leave the restaurant. And with a year reserves, that means if I close no deals in a year, which is not the plan, I have a year full of reserves to, you know, to sit on <laughs> and I have to worry about anything so I can put my all into this real estate stuff and just blast off with it. So it's like, and, and, you know, I'm willing to sacrifice well, a year of not making money two years, three, four, five years, because 87% of agents leave within the first five years, 80% leave after the first two years. Right. So it's like a room full of a hundred people that get their license. And pretty much everyone is like leaving the business in two to five years. On top of that, the market's currently, you know, uh, transitioning a little bit and we have the economic uncertainty. This is exactly. the best time to be getting into the real estate market as a uh, agent, because you know what, uh, these, these good times. Um, yeah, read, um, exactly. And now laziness. all the agents that got their license in the pandemic, because as you know, real estate has one of the lowest barriers to entry. All of them are going to be heading out of the industry. So everyone that stays, it's going to be able to take a market share, you know, a bigger market share than they would have in, you know, during the pandemic time. Because now all the pandemic agents that were doing well without trying, they're going to start, you know, flushing out for the most part. Right. So uh, I'm willing to stick with it and better myself, as I said earlier. Right. So that's where I'm at right now. But yeah, so as you start it. wrapping up a little bit, love you know, it, love um, love what do you have in the plans? You know, where can we find you out? You know, what do you have any? And I, mean, I know you said you're going to be in Dallas next week, but um, you know what you I got Dallas, I got Atlanta, I've got uh, LA, Phoenix, New York coming up. You know, again, the easiest way before that uh, marketing starts going out there to do it, just go to my Sean 360. And just remember, Sean is S A E N 360.com. And you can click on any of the links in there. There's the, there's the YouTube, there's Instagram. I posted some reels in there. Um, uh, Twitter, I, I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> yeah, skip Twitter. <laughs> doing, skip it? Twitter. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, skip Twitter, whatever. But you know, so if you want to come to one of my live events, I'd love to see you out there. Let me know that John sent you, and uh, um, you know that'd be good. But uh, yeah, just that's the way you can do it. I mean, you guys, we got a lot of events coming up over the next twelve months. Um, you know that you can come and um, I, and and so you understand that um, I'm actually teaching our, our workshops. So we've got an introductory class that's really you know, a couple hours long that talks about what really this is all about. And then that's kind of say, okay, you want to learn? Okay, come to my, come to our workshop and we'll teach you how to do it. And here's one thing I want to leave everybody with. One of the things I don't do is I don't teach anything that I haven't done. So as, as I say before, I, I eat my own cooking without throwing up. So I'm talking about real deals that I'm really doing and showing practical stuff. I don't want to, I'm not going to teach anybody how to buy a, 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 yeah. a jet, no offense, Grant, but, uh, most people aren't going to do that. They teach you how to become self-sufficient and uh, master something so that you can sit there and make choices yeah, because okay. you want to know. I, I like that that metaphor you use. I like I eat my own cooking without throwing up. I haven't heard that one before. I really like it. I'm going to steal that. I'm definitely going to steal that one. So before we... Good. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Sure, we, so before we wrap clear, up, right? we have our... used to be five questions, but I narrowed it down to four. So our final, our final four questions, right? First okay. one is... What is the most impactful lesson that you learned in life? Ha. Huh. The most impactful lesson that you learn in life. Master something, anything. Master. I don't care if you want to become a postman. You know, I don't care if you want to become, you know, an internet sensation. Then master it. Put the time in to make it happen. Um, you know, the impactful lesson. So if I'm going to go back, I think it's going to be relationships. 
you know, be in the relationships. And I mean, significant others too, because I've made some big mistakes in that area where, you know, I didn't listen to my heart and look at where we were going and it didn't turn out well. And so if I can amplify that to other things out there, John, it's relationships, be super clear on relationships. I was just in a meeting with a partner of mine on a new project that we're doing. I go, you know what, you haven't stated what you want in this. So just so you're clear, um, I reevaluate relationships every, every year. And so let's see that you're getting what you want out of this relationship and I'm getting what I want out of this relationship and we're going to renew every year. And I was taught that about six years ago and it's really worked well for me. So um, most impactful thing is, you know, make sure everybody's got clarity. Okay, yeah, That's definitely big. That's like for all relationships in life, whether work, business, personal, like everything. Personal, absolutely. You know, your significant other. You yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be careful, guys. It's not exactly yeah. the best business contract to get in. Yeah. So make sure. And the mean, second one is, what is the most admirable trait a person can have? Do what they say, when they say, and how they say for how much they're going to say. Okay. Be dependable. That, that's just big. You know what? Um, understand the, the power of the positive no. Don't yeah. commit to something unless you can get it done. So deliver. Okay. Deliver. If you wanted deliver. to change someone's life with one book, which one would you recommend? With one book? That's a tough one. You know, Think and Grow Rich is on the top of there. And I think that that is, that is, I like, gosh, I don't, I don't have one book, but Think and Grow Rich is really up there. And that's more on a, on yeah. a monetary type of thing. It's the way you should, you should think. Um, because it is so, that, that is definitely the foundational piece for success. Hands down. Um, Man's Search for Meaning uh, is, you know, super duper powerful. Um, you know, Victor Frankel, um, it's one of the top 10 books in the Library of Congress. I think that that spiritually mm -hmm. is a huge impact, um, you know, and then, you know, I'm going to put a third one in there is Enlightenment Now, um, which talks about how lucky we really are right now. I think with the advent of social media and all the bullshit that it's putting out there and polluting people's mind, we are in the best era and time frame yeah. ever before in human history. Don't forget that. And we're in the best country to make that happen. I just got back from Mongolia. Love the country to death. It is a former mm -hmm. Soviet bloc and you can see it. You can see it in the people's eyes. You can see it in their opportunity and everything else. Yes, don't forget that. And don't buy into the BS that's out there. It's just not true. We are in the best area, yeah. place and time in human history to be the best we can. We have a moral obligation yeah. as an American. I, we kind of probably could have went to a whole podcast episode on that topic alone, <laughs> but I definitely agree with you there. And the last yeah. question, what is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind in a couple sentences? If you could wrap it up. A legacy I'm trying to keep behind is, is just pass it on so that other people can do exactly what I'm doing. Help people. You well, all right. You more There's one guy that more said uh, the success is helping others win. And so, yeah, so that is my final yeah. four question. That is what pretty much that? it for the interview, Sean. It was a pleasure bringing you on. I definitely enjoyed this uh, this one a, a ton. I know the viewers would definitely have a lot to take away. Um, for the most part, I think this one should be going live literally this Sunday. Uh, so you came at a very, very, very convenient oh, time wow. <laughs> for the most part. So if you want to, if those, if that's the case, uh, if any of you listeners are in Dallas, um, hit up the link in the 360 and I'll be at one of those locations, which is very rare for me to be at a preview event, but I have to. Sounds good. Well, all righty, Sean, Dallas, it was a pleasure. Take care and uh, hopefully get you, uh, see you at one of these events in the future. All right, take care. Absolutely.